Good morning to you. Take your Bibles if you would and let's look at Luke chapter 12 where we've been in this great study, particularly in this area where Jesus begins to tell us about the fear of God and to concern Himself with whether or not we are fearing men. You know, we read Psalm 139, and as you know, that is a comforting psalm because it illustrates for us this great reality that God is omniscient, He is omnipresent, He does watch over His people, and His watch care is 24-7. But all of us at one time or another have wondered about that, and in the weakness of our own flesh, and in the struggles of life, and as our faith is being pressured and stretched, we have asked ourselves whether or not God even knows what we're facing, or, or perhaps you've asked yourself whether He cares about what you're facing in your life. Does He know what's going on in my life truly, really? The things that push me to the limits and beyond, I mean, really know? Does He care? Perhaps He knows what I'm up against, but but he's not considering it or concerning himself with it in the all-consuming way that I tend to have to concern myself with such things. We've even had those kinds of questions come to our mind. And we're told by the psalmist in Psalm 42, verse 5, when he is in similar circumstances, that he cried out to himself. He spoke to himself and said, why are you so downcast within me? Why, O oh soul, are you depressed and discouraged? Hope in God, this is what he says. Well, I want to put my hope in God, just like you do. But can God deliver? That is the question that continually rises in the weakness of our life. Can God deliver? Because hope it ultimately involves a security, an ultimate kind of security. And that kind of security has to have a reliable basis, or it's no guarantee at all, it's just an illusion. For my hope to be real, it has to be grounded in something outside of myself, since I can't seem to secure myself on my own. And if the Scriptures tell me to put my hope in God, then He has to be a reliable basis for my ultimate security, or else I have no true or genuine hope. And all of this reliability comes again and again in the Scriptures in descriptions of God that He makes of Himself in Holy Scripture through various servants, the pen of those inspired. Just a sampling of the Scriptures tells you that He promises He is that kind of a God. He's that reliable. Isaiah 25, 1, O Lord, You are my God, for You've done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. Faithful and reliable, plans formed of old, ordained paths for me before I even saw a day unfold. And they're faithful and sure plans. 2 Thessalonians 3 3, the Lord is faithful, he will establish you, he will guard you against the evil one. He will do it. The establishing and guarding is his promise. Psalm 121, verse 3, he will not let your foot be moved. And he who keeps you will not slumber. He doesn't sleep on the job. He's always on. Verse we often memorize, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no test or temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And right in the center of the verse, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability, but with the temptation will provide a way to endure it, a way to escape sin and get through it. He will provide it. That's His promise. Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you, Psalm 55, 22. And it says He will never permit the righteous to be moved. That is to say, moved away from your faith, crushed in your faith, moved away from God. Psalm 138, verse 8, the Lord will fulfill His purposes for me. It's very personal. He'll fulfill His purposes for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. That is to say, your purposes for me will be carried out. They are forever. Psalm 59, verse 16, but I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for you have been to me a fortress, a refuge in the day of my distress. 
Of course, you know the classic text, Lamentations 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He satisfies. Psalm 107 verse 9, if your soul longs for him, he satisfies the longing soul. And the hungry soul, he fills with good things. This is our God who boldly promises to be a reliable God, the hope, the basis for your security. James 1.17 says that he doesn't vary, he doesn't shift. I love that. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shifting, there's no variation. He doesn't vacillate like you and I. He's not capricious. Psalm 86 verse 5, for you, O Lord, are good and forgiving abounding in steadfast love, steadfast love. These are bold promises. God reveals that He is steadfast, He's he's faithful, and He will never forsake His beloved ones. And it promises that he, He will never allow anything to enter our experience without His protection and His comprehensive watch care over all of it. No wonder then that the Lord Himself, when talking about fearing men versus revering God and putting your focus on God, no wonder then He says what He says here in Luke chapter 12 and verse 4, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. This comes as an urgent warning because He knows what the human heart will do. We will think horizontally all the time rather than vertically. We will gravitate toward coddling and comforting and protecting our life, taking care of our own watch care and not leaving it to God. That's what we will be prone to do. So he says, I warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Fear him. That's what I'm telling you. The last time we looked at this as to why we ought to fear God, we, we looked at it from one particular angle. We looked at it from a negative angle. Why do we fear God? Because as Jesus makes clear here, God is the one who is the ultimate record keeper. He keeps all the books. He marks everything down, thought, word, and deed, and one day He will unmask it all. Everything hidden will be made known. And so there, Jesus looks at the fear of God from the idea that there is this negative side. There's there's this divine record keeper and there's this unveiling that's going to happen and there's a judgment to come for those who've rejected God and you will not be escaping it. You will not be hidden from it. But here is the other side. Now Jesus looks at the fear of God from the other angle. As God claims to be the ultimate comforter to His people, the ultimate security for the believer. It's one thing to know that God keeps the divine record book of all thoughts, words, and deeds, and that He's going to one day pull down that veil and everything hidden is going to be revealed. So I don't have to fear what the world does to me because their day is coming. Evil done against me, even backdoor evil, even back alley things, it's all coming to light. It will all be made right. Human justice is nothing compared to divine justice. Abel's blood cried out from the ground against his brother who had taken his life. All such things cry out to God and they will be revealed. It's one thing to fear God as that kind of a judge, but it's also another thing to fear God because of what He has declared about His intimate knowledge of us and His meticulous concern, His scrupulous concern, we might say, His intricate watch care over the details of our life, every single detail. Jesus says because of that, fear Him. And He tells us by way of comparison, and He he offers two comparisons in verses 6 and verse 7 here. He says in verse 5, fear Him, I tell you, and then verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two cents, yet not one of them is forgotten before God? Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered, do not fear. Why? Verse 7, you are more valuable than many sparrows. So here it is. Jesus is now looking at it from the other side. If you are in Christ, then you have both angles. You do not have to concern yourself with what may befall you here at the hands of people or nature or life in a fallen universe. 
because God will make all those things right and he will unveil everything that was done against God's people. And isn't that what we all would love to see? We all love to see Satan dealt with. We all would love to see evil crushed and finally done away with. We'd love to see an earth filled with the glory of Christ. And we'd love to see everyone perfected in holiness and living in and through and for him. That's what we would want. All of that's coming. And so on that basis, you should fear him, not men. But now Jesus looks at it from the other side and says, now I'm going to tell you that he is also a comfort to you because of his watch care, his intimacy, his closeness, his nearness, his meticulous way in which he watches over his people. And so he argues for our value to God. Now, this is an intrinsic value. Clearly, we're in sin as at conception. Clearly, we have no inherent worth as fallen creatures, worthy of judgment. God could have saved no one, and he would have been just, absolutely just. So don't imagine that somehow God saves his people because they are uh, somehow intrinsically worthy. No, that's the whole point of the love of the cross of Christ is that we weren't worthy. That's what makes it so magnanimous, so rich, so beyond comprehension. We were worthy of nothing. We were enemies, destroyable, cursed. But he died. He loved. He gave. That's what makes his love so great as we learned from John 3.16 just a couple of weeks ago. But no, here we are of value to God because God declares it so. Because God set his love upon us, we're valuable to him. And it is a kind of value Jesus illustrates by these two simple contrasts. And I love this. He is going to contrast us in two very simple statements. One with insignificant things, inconsequential things, and two with infinitesimal things, tiny things, small things, things that are absolutely nothing to think about and, and cannot be measured, really. Things beyond the naked eye, things that, that we would never be able to discover ultimately without some special means. He compares us with what is inconsequential and insignificant, and he compares us with what is infinitesimal, tiny, nothing and by that, he demonstrates just what God thinks about you and just what God thinks about me and why we ought not to have some sinful fear of the horizontal. Notice what he says in verse 6 when he makes this comparison with the insignificant. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? <laughs> and uh, he just the emphasis here is on little. Five little sparrows for for these two little cents. That's essentially how it's written here in the original. Everything's sort of making it really small. Five little birds for two little coins. The Roman copper coin was an Assyrian. That's what's used here, a copper coin. It was one sixteenth of, of the silver coin in Rome. The silver coin in Rome was the drachma. That was about a day's wage, whatever that might be calculated to mean. Some guys actually, some scholars actually make that their their uh, study all their life. They study the currency and the exchange rates and ancient coinage and all that kind of stuff. In fact, here's a fun fact. You can amaze your friends. They're called numismatists. Numismatists. So go to dinner tonight and say, hey, you know what a numismatist is? If you mess up the word, no one, it won't make sense to anybody, but hey, <laughs> try it on your friends. You'll amaze them. So basically, a sixteenth of a day's wage was what was spent on what he calls these little, tiny, insignificant, inconsequential creatures. And according to the text, you could buy five of them for two of these Assyrians. In the Diocletian era, two, late 200s to the early 300s, uh, documentation said that essentially they were sold in the marketplace to the poor. They, they, that's why they went so cheap. They were commonplace, they were mundane, and they were often offered at these cheap rates for the poor of society, typically sold by twos or in groups of five at this price. Two sparrows for an Assyrian. Matthew 10, verse 29, a parallel text, says you could get two of these for one of the small copper coins. Two sparrows sold for a cent. So there you have it. You spend two coins, you get four birds, and a fifth gets thrown in. So you get it in a group of five. What is Jesus' point? It's mundane. It's insignificant. It's inconsequential. It's everyday. It's commonplace. These birds somewhere are 
little chicks in a nest, and then they grow up and they fly around. Then there's somebody's food, and they're sold in the open market to the poor of society for less than nothing. They're insignificant. They don't mean anything other than to serve humanity. They're of no consequence. Yet look at verse 6. Yet, not one of them is forgotten before God. Very specific statement. Not even a single one of them is the language here. Not even a single one of them is forgotten or escapes God's gaze or His sight, His eyesight. Improsthen is that preposition which means before His sight, before His eyes. Every single one of them across the globe for all time in all human history, one is born, one flies, one dies, one goes to the food market. Not any one of them are ever out of His gaze personally as the God of the universe. This is, this is mind-boggling, mind-boggling. How many birds in your yard in just one morning singing? They're here today, gone tomorrow. God knows every single one of them. Matthew's gospel says he is aware of every single foot of one of these birds that touches the ground or hops on the ground. Some of your translations say he's aware of a sparrow that falls to the ground. It's actually a, probably not the best translation. It just means any, any touching of the bird to the earth. He's aware of all that. He's aware of every place a bird lands. Any bird, all birds. This is just amazing. And Jesus says, look, the inconsequential nature of this is that when it is flying around, God knows what it's doing. When it lands on the earth, God knows what it's doing. And then it is taken and killed and given to the commonplace market for the poor of society and sold for cheap. It's inconsequential. It's nothing. No one thinks about this at all. It's everyday things that human beings do not even consider yet. Every single one of them is in the gaze of God, and none of them, not a single bird, escapes his care. I mean, when you start to think about why you're fearing things on the horizontal, this this now begins to deepen in our understanding and starts to humble our proud hearts. Take a moment and look with me at Job 38. Look back to the Psalms and then one book before the Psalms, Job chapter 38. Very familiar text if, you've, if you're familiar with the struggle of Job in the difficult trial of his life. But it's very interesting where God goes when God is trying to ask Job questions in sort of a little Q&A where God's the one asking questions and Job has to answer But God uses the animal world to prove a point. And it is similar to the point Jesus makes in Luke 12. Notice chapter 38 of Job, verse 39. Job, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in their lair? Who prepares for the raven its nourishment when its young cry to God and wander about without food? All right, Job, if you're you're so up on knowledge and you're so up on your situation and you're so up on whether or not there, are, there have to be good purposes behind what has befallen you. So in this q and I'm asking you questions. You cinch up your belt. You tell me, are you taking care of the animal world in these ways that you do not see? You can't see them. You don't know them. You don't know where they are. You might find one, but you don't know across the globe. Yet God in this text, is the one preparing for the raven its nourishment. Look at verse 1 of chapter 39. Do you know the time the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you count the months they fulfill, or do you know the time they give birth? In other words, on the spot. Do you know the time that that particular one is giving birth? Not just in general the gestation period of deers in labor, but that one deer up on that mountain, behind that tree, giving birth in that moment. Do you know that? They kneel down, they bring forth their young, they get rid of their labor pains, their offspring become strong, they grow up in the open field, they leave and don't return to them. You don't know where they roam, you don't know whether they've grown up or not, you have no idea. You can take your, yourself out into the wilderness, and, and of course now, here we are thousands of years later, and we have, we have National Geographic. 
How many animals can National Geographic catch doing all these things? Not all of them. Who sent out the wild donkey free and loosed the bonds of the swift donkey? To whom I gave the wilderness for a home and the salt for his land for his dwelling place? Look at verse 13. The ostrich's wings flap joyously with the pinion and plumage of love, and for she abandons her eggs to the earth and warms them in the dust, and then she forgets that a foot may crush them or a wild beast may trample them. She treats her young cruelly as if they were not hers, though her labor be in vain. She's unconcerned. Why? Because God has made her forget wisdom and has not given her a share of understanding. And when she lifts herself on high, she laughs at the horse and his rider. Look, this is God's business to take care of them. He, he chooses to have some creatures do one thing with their life cycle and others to do another. It is God who watches over all this. Verse 19, did you give the horse his might? Did you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? When he runs to battle, verse 24, he races over the ground. He does not stand still at the voice of the trumpet. Are you the one that did all that? Or is it by your understanding, verse 26, that the hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? From there, verse 29, he spies out food and sees it from afar, and his young then are near the slain, and they end up eating. This is, this is our great God. Jesus then looks at it from the other side. Look, if, if, Job, if you can't do any of those things, but God does... And then Jesus says, and if God is so scrupulous and so meticulous that the inconsequential and insignificant elements of the creature world, he watches over meticulously. And listen, you certainly cannot be out of his care for a moment. You cannot have a detail of your life not known. As Psalm 139 says, there isn't even a word on your tongue. There isn't a place you could go where God doesn't know it or hasn't surrounded you. And notice back in Luke 12, the end of verse 7, you are more valuable than many sparrows. You are more valuable. Literally, we, we, the difference between us and them is massive. The, the word literally means a difference. You excel far more in importance to God. And the many here isn't a reference to a few sparrows. It's just a, a, a way of writing the analogy to suggest that you, your life, your personal life is beyond, in terms of its value, than all the birds of the world, and yet God sees all of them, they're all in his presence, he, he knows where they step, he, he takes care of every single one of them in that meticulous way. And here's what we do, we imagine that there is some detail of our life that God has missed. He's missed it. Not so. If he knows when an insignificant bird, which might be here today and tomorrow somebody's dinner, if he knows everything they're doing, then he knows when somebody's ridiculed you or mocked you or some natural evil has befallen you or some, something in your metabolism is changing and you've contracted some disease you didn't want or some discomfort's come your way or, or some struggle has come your way, some circumstance in your life isn't what you had expected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He knows all of that. He has intimate knowledge of every time... That occurs and even ordains that those thing occur, things occur for your greater good. He watches over the insignificant things and you're much more valuable so you can never be out from underneath His caring eye. You're of much more worth than insignificant little creatures. The difference is immeasurable is Jesus' point. Our problem, beloved, is that we just simply in the moment of concern do not believe that. We just do not believe that in the moment. We read Psalm 139, yes, it's too wonderful for me. I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. This is marvelous. Where can I go from your spirit? We sing it in songs. But in the moment, in the moment, we have an agenda of the heart that is often different than God's agenda and denies who he is. We set our hearts on a kind of life that is free of the things we fear right here in front of us on the horizontal. We idolize it. We wish for it. We put it on lists. We pray about it. We coddle it. We might even burn candles to it. That is where we bow down. 
We fear what man can do to us. We fear what circumstances will bring to us. We, we fear some evil befalling us. And, and let's face it, no rational person wants pain, but we idolize a life without it. We will sin to get a life without it. And no sane person would love trouble, but we live in fear of it and set our hearts on having a life without it. And so we crowd God out and make up different versions of Him to have that. This week I had sent to me a great little section from Paul Tripp's book, A Quest for More. And in his chapter on hope, this is how he describes this issue. And I thought it was poignant and worthy of our interest this morning. Listen to Paul Tripp on this very issue. When you elevate your little kingdom desires to needs, you no longer live with guarantees. God has not promised to deliver all the things you've hoped, desired, and convinced yourself you cannot live without. You have attached your happiness to a deeply romantic marriage, but God hasn't promised to give you one. You have connected your identity to a long, successful career, but God has not promised to deliver it. You've glued your well-being to your physical or material health, but God hasn't guaranteed you either one of them. You've placed your value in being a successful parent with trophy children, but God has not contracted to deliver your family dream. Of course, these things are all wonderful to desire and worthwhile your experience, but they are out of your control and your Redeemer is not guaranteed to give them to you. Further, when these things control your heart and command your hopes, you will tend to judge God's faithfulness not by whether He's been true to His promises, but by whether He's given you the things that you've set your heart on. And then he says this, but this is right where the redemptive quandary lies. If God gives you the things that are playing a role in your life that only He is supposed to play, wouldn't He be encouraging you in the very addictions from which His grace is meant to free you? End quote. That's right. Why would God give you the trouble-free script for your life that you want if it's going to keep you from only turning to Him and only believing that His watch care can keep you from the free, free from the fear of man? He wouldn't do that. He would not do that. Tripp goes on to say, in fact, I'm convinced that much of the resistance we attribute to the enemy is actually the resistance of the Lord. He stands against us, not because he doesn't love us, but because he does love us. He stands in our way because what we want is spiritually in the way of what he wants for us. He's dead on. Jesus makes a comparison with the insignificant to tell us an imperative, a command. Notice verse 7, do not fear. There it is. Look, if he is taking care of the insignificant and inconsequential, the little bird that flies and is killed and sold on the market to the poor people for next to nothing, if he watches over the insignificant and you're much more valuable than a globe of sparrows, then do not fear. You place your trust in God alone to give you the life he wants you to have for his honor and glory. It is the best life. You fight against that, you have no guarantees except chastening and loving parental discipline and sometimes scars that really you don't need to have. I love how Paul Tripp finishes that chapter. He says, big kingdom hope rests in one place and one place alone. God, it is the deeply held and daily acted upon trust that God is the ultimate source of all that is wise and true and loving and good and that what he's doing is best and that what he has promised is reliable. I remember years ago when I was young and we would be facing trials and I remember having to say to my own heart, hey, there can be no better path than this one or it wouldn't be happening. This has to be the best path. Even if it involved consequences from my sin, it was a good teacher to me for the honor and glory of Christ. And since I'm under His grace, then failure is never final. Then what Jesus does is absolutely rich. He follows this comparison with the insignificant, with this comparison with the small, the, the infinitesimal. <laughs> Notice Luke 12, 7, 
He said, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. <laughs> oh, that's a funny one. That's a funny one. A little easier to count some than others. But that's not Jesus' point. And in fact, the language here is unmistakable. Regardless of statistics about the average head of hair and all that kind of stuff, look, God made us fearfully and wonderfully. He knows how all that works. But what is fascinating about this is what Jesus actually says about what God knows. He teaches that each hair is not only counted, but has its own individual number in the knowledge of God, so to speak. In other words, he knows every single one, has, has the knowledge of the count of every single one, so that even if any hair is removed, God knows precisely which one it is. That's the point. That's the comprehensive nature of his knowledge. You say, who cares about all that? Yes. Now you're getting the point. Who cares about all that? You and I couldn't. How are we going to measure that? The average head of hair is somewhere between 100,000 and 140,000 if it's a normal, natural head of hair, regardless of what happens to it later. But who cares? I mean, we, we've counted that by, by averages and statistics. We don't really know, and we haven't numbered every single one. We just say in general what it is, because that's all we can do. The point is, God knows every single one. Numbered every single one of your life. That is staggering knowledge. And Jesus is saying, yeah, exactly. It is so, so beyond our comprehension and so tiny in its measurement that, look, if God knows that, then you must understand that there isn't a moment of your life both coming into the things that you face in the middle of the things that you face and the fruit from the things you face. Not a moment of it that has not been ordained by Him with perfection for your life and my life. The problem, beloved, is we just don't believe that in the moment. We would rather not. Because to believe that means we have to do some things. First of all, we have to obey the simple command here. Do not fear. Stop fearing. Listen, medications for anxiety in this country are a multi-billion dollar business. And a lot of times it's flat out unnecessary. And I know that from 25 years of counseling, beloved. I have sat with people who have been treated after treated after treated, medicated after medicated after medicated. And regardless of what we might say about each individual case, many times... Depressed people, discouraged people, after coming to grips with who God is and coming to grips with the Scriptures, on their own begin to build a new framework of stability in how they think. Our nation is full of anxieties because of its distance from God and its unbelief. Unbelief always brings depression to a human heart that is meant for God. Always. You want hope? Seek God. Seek God. He knows everything about your life. He knows he, how He skillfully wrought you. He knows how you respond to trouble. He knows your heart. He knows all the ways your mind works. He knows the way you're wired. We always talk about wiring. Wiring is interesting. We're all diverse. He knows it. He crafted it. He made it. He formed it. You didn't form any of that. You were in your mother's womb. What do you know? What did your mom know? She didn't know. God knew he was weaving it perfectly, exactly as he wants. And he knew the life you'd live. I, that just makes my mind explode, that he knew the life I was going to live, both in its hypocrisy before Christ and then in redemption and after that. He knew it, and he knows all of it until I'm going to get to Christ. He, he's ordained it all before there was even a day of it. Now, that, to me, is comforting and at times unsettling to my unbelieving heart. Listen to A.W. Tozer on, in probably one of the classic books on the character of God in his chapter on the knowledge of God, in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Listen to this. 
God knows instantly and effortlessly all matters and all matter, all mind and every mind, all spirit and all spirits, all being and every being, all creaturehood and all creatures, every, every plurality and all pluralities, every law and all law, all relations, all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feeling, all desires, every unuttered secret, all thrones and dominions, all personalities, all things visible and invisible in heaven and on earth. He knows all motion, space, time, life, death, good, evil, heaven, and hell. Anything missing? Because God knows all things perfectly, He knows nothing better than any other thing, but all things equally well. He never discovers anything. He's never surprised. He's never amazed. Isn't that marvelous? It's true. God's not surprised. He's not amazed. I mean, you can run to Him and say, Lord, do you know what's happening? Yes. <laughs> and I'm hurting with you, and I, I draw near to you. He draws near to the broken heart of the Scriptures say, and He enters into our pain, and He comes down and meets His people, and all that He's ordained, He enters into, and He feels it. Don't you love that? He's not some unmoved mover up there who's just sort of moving bars and things around. He comes into our world, ministers to us up close and personal. We throw our pain on Him. We cast our anxiety on Him, and He knows it. But surprised? No. Amazed? No. Discovering something new? Absolutely not. No matter what the open theist said. He doesn't seek information or ask questions. He's self-existent, self-contained, and he knows what he knows what no creature can ever know. He knows himself fully. He knows who he is perfectly, eternally. He knows exactly what he did and why he created what he created and how it works. And he knows you and he knows your life down to the detail. And look, Jesus' point is look, if he watches over meticulously the foot of every bird that's ever existed across the globe landing on the earth and he cares with meticulous attention to that and you're worth more than a globe of those sparrows and he's watching over you and by the way he he knows the hair numbers of your head and each individual hair and what it is and how it is and why it is or isn't as the case may be and if that's the case, then Jesus takes that final statement and it governs both comparisons. You are worth more. You're more valuable than any of those things. So he says, do not fear. This is, this is staggering, rich truth. What do we do with it? Well, here's, here's the little heart step-by-step -step thing you've got to have in your, going, going through your mind when you are prone to, to not believe. And by the way, you might as well admit that up front. Lord, I've got to cast my anxieties on you, but the moment I cast them on you, I sometimes take them back. That's my problem. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your anxieties on the Lord, for He cares for you. Yeah, but sometimes I don't particularly care for how He cares for me. I'd like to do something different. And so you're going to have to admit that up front. But here's a little step-by-step -step process you, you must work through in your mind. This is sort of unpacking Jesus' phrase, fear him and do not fear men. So first of all, you must rest. You must rest. God is a God of great watch care and great promise. He's reliable. He is your hope. You rest in him. You don't rest on the words of human counselors, though they can be biblical and therefore helpful. You rest on his word. You rest on his promise. You rest on his character. You rest in it. That is to say, your anxiety needs to be cast on him. Cast there, left there, brought there, spoken to him. Cry out to him. Say it. Speak it. Leave it there. With only one expectation, that you, O oh God, are the God of meticulous watch care. And I'm never out from underneath it. You know exactly what I'm feeling right now in this moment. Secondly, you're going to have to speak truth to your soul. The psalmist said, Psalm 42, verse 5, Why are you so downcast, O oh, my soul? Put your hope in God. You have to talk to yourself with truth. You have to speak truth to yourself. And just be straightforward with it. Have you ever done that? I mean, sometimes we, we go to counselors or we go to shepherd somebody, uh, we go to get some shepherding from somebody, some, some wisdom from a friend. 
But when they come over, we're still in an argumentative stage. They're giving us counsel, but we're still arguing. Look, wouldn't it be nice if you called a friend and said, I am in the throes of it, I need prayer and help, and when they arrive, you're already in a major discussion with your own soul. Why are you despairing, soul? Put your hope in God. I will yet praise Him. I will yet be brought to the land of the living. It will happen. Why are you despairing? There's no reason to despair. Circumstantially, every reason in the world to feel pain. Eternally, spiritually, sustaining grace? No, there's no reason. Why are you despairing? We don't do that. You've got to speak truth to your soul and be blunt. Now, that assumes then a third. That means you're going to have to know some truth to speak to your soul. So I would just tell you, if you don't have a deep enough understanding of, God, of the knowledge of who God is, then you need to course through the Scriptures because it is all about His... I just gave you a sampling earlier. It's just all about the character and nature of Almighty God. Deepen your knowledge of who He is. It will change your life in a trial and in a test. To know God by the Scripture's revelation, and to believe it is to be empowered, beloved. Number four, exercise your faith muscle. <laughs> I know what we do. Lord, I will believe in you, but you got to give me some guarantees. Well, you don't have to exercise faith if you get guarantees before you step out. Faith is stepping out when there are no guarantees. Remember Abraham? Do you remember that? He had no guarantees. And Romans 4 says, in hope against hope, he believed and he didn't waver in unbelief but knew that God is able. He believed that God is able. Well, there it is. Circumstances didn't match. He's too old. His wife's too old. He's been in the land 10 years. No child of promise. How in the world are you going to keep your integrity having promised that we're going to bless all the families of the earth? And I have no child of promise. And it says there that Abraham grew strong in his faith because against all the odds, he exercised that muscle of entrusting himself to God against the odds. You don't see an end to your struggle? Exercise faith in that moment. If you wait for a guarantee or your circumstances to change, your faith is atrophying. It's not growing stronger. And later, Satan will have an inroad because you will have wavered in unbelief and opened the fence to be exploited. Fifthly, you're going to have to identify the lies that you believe about God and repent of them. On the spot, verbally, openly, before God, you're going to have to confess that you believe lies about Him. You actually attack His character either directly or indirectly or with assumptions and presumptions. That's what you're doing. And you've got to repent of those in the moment with humility. Lord, I I believe lies about you. I let things raise up against the knowledge of you. And I'm learning in Scripture who you are. You're a God of meticulous care, and I have claimed, I have even accused you of having missed some details in my life. That's a lie, and you've believed it, and you're going to have to turn from it with confession and brokenness. Lord, please forgive me for believing wrong things about you. Rest in his promise of watch care, laying your anxiety at his feet and leaving it there. Speak truth to your soul. Deepen your knowledge of God, exercise that faith muscle, and repent of these wrong conclusions, these lies about God. Jesus says to his people, we fear him because you're of more value than all the insignificant things, all the infinitesimal things, and yet he watches over all that. Has God missed something? No. No. Do we believe that? Not always. Not always. To our shame for a God like ours. Let's bow together. Lord, we need you. We desperately need your work in our hearts through such great contrasts that Jesus makes. You've told us we're more valuable and we just often think because of our troubled lives that, that somehow you're lying to us. But you cannot lie. And you're so patient with us. We take advantage of your patience. Because you're so gracious, we feel we can rail at you and, 
and not have it affect our faith and our strength and our usefulness and fruitfulness and even personal depth and maturity and holiness, but it will. Lord, help us to believe these things, to lay our anxieties at your feet, to speak truth to our own souls, to counsel ourselves with brutal counsel if we need to. Thank you for your long-suffering with weak and feeble people. May we come to you with hope, in hope, that you are a God who already knows these things and you're not surprised and you're never amazed. And you want us to come and just cry out, leaving all the responses and answers to a holy and wise God who knows it all. Lord, we lose heart so quickly. Help us to trust you, to know you and to trust you and to do as our Lord commands. Do not fear men. Do not fear the world around us or its evil, but trust you. May we be a people who help each other do that and seek you for the strength that you provide, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.